Uncensored Truth Podcast. I'm your brother, Ogar, from Hip Hop News Uncensored. And we got a special guest today. But before we introduce him, sitting across from me, as always, is my co host. What it do? What's good? It's your brother, Sam Ant, Viral Hip Hop News. We're in the building for a very special episode, like Ogar said, of the Uncensored Truth Podcast. Shout out to everyone watching and listening on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're watching or listening. We got a special treat for you today. Yeah. Like Ogar said, our brother, CEO of Hip Hop Motivation, author, of the book culture vultures co-author with dame dash thinking ball out secret to balling ceo none other than our brother kenyatta griggs it's good to have you on man brother what's good with you man peace man everything's good man how, how y'all beautiful beautiful man you know Bro. just humble you know to be in the building and we appreciate the opportunity man to take time out to come on to the you know the platform definitely anytime man anytime dope yes, man so you mean today was tuesday bro so you know it was voting day did you get out and vote <laughs> yeah you know what's crazy i'm on my way as soon as i finish because uh a little church by my mom's is uh they still they stay open kind of uh, late so i'm gonna go by there and get that in for a minute you know did y'all vote y'all voted already actually i didn't you know uh -huh. um I got I got tied up in some drama back in my old days, so I never after I wasn't able to vote, I kind of never did it again. So that's what kind of happened with that. Yeah. No, nah, it's all good. You know how it go. You know, it's, right? It and holds I, I, a it holds a polarity of uh, conversation on voting. You know, it's you know it right. is one of those things. You and know? I, I, I did not vote and i wanted to get your perspective on that the whole the whole right. voting thing because we see out in in society, social media, all call our culture in particular. It's out there like no other vote 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 so so what's your perspective on the whole voting thing well to be honest with you you know to me I'm, I'm gonna go out there and just check out the ballots but um for me it seems like you know so it's a lot of romanticism you know because it's like you you keep repeating the same thing and expecting different results it's like which guy do you vote for and which person do you trust at this point when you've seen so many people come forth with what they're going to do and so many different things of that would help people but then we found out it didn't help anyone in the end but the people that were you know the the rich you know the poor continued to suffer so you know it's, it's a strange thing man it's like if you you damned if you do you damned if you don't you know i don't disagree with anyone that wants to vote it's just like religion you know if you whatever you believe is what you believe but at the same time you know just don't go into it with the understand well, don't go into it just thinking that it's definitely going to change something because you know we've seen over history it hasn't what is it done you know what i'm saying i got a grandmother that's 101 years old and i asked her you know about different things like this and you know her perspective what her perspective is on that 101 years ago you know what about her grandmother i mean you know i, I just feel like black people still in the same position that we've always been in we, we we're very loving people we're very trusting but at the same time we get caught up in romanticism facts 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 yeah man I, I could definitely you know uh agree with that a lot yeah. of us just go out and they don't even know they just vote right down the line as we always say they don't really know the politics they're not really involved they just do it because right. they was kind of taught to do so so yeah. you know, i definitely agree with you that 100 percent on that brother definitely indeed yeah. indeed man so yeah he was ceo of a lot yeah i mean you got a lot going on but we both read the book um let me be the first to say it. i was definitely a fan of the book Open my eyes up to a lot of different things. And I, I love Dane's perspective, but I, I also loved your perspective and, and grew to be a fan of yours throughout reading the book. And I was initially introduced to you in hip hop motivation through Oh God and watching different videos and things like that on Dame Dash. We're both big fans and just became great fans of yours. And in the book, you talked about being a barber and starting off being a barber. So um, before we get to barbering, though, my bad, what was your first business you started? Was that the first business? So what was the first business venture you got into? Well, the, the first business venture I, I started was going into um, uh, barbering, you know, being self-employed. But I started cutting when I was in junior high school. And at that time, it was for free. I wasn't really I wasn't charging my homeboys. I would get like a little couple of dollars here and there. And um, that was really just to develop my skills. It wasn't something that I truly wanted to do, though, right off. Um, I've always been a writer. I've always been into reading, studying, you know, even when I was a, a kid, you know, and a teenager. I've been real deep into studying and just studying really the occult knowledge. I was a fan of um, Dungeons and Dragons growing up. Like uh, my cousin, uh, we played Dungeons and Dragons for like damn near sometimes six to eight hours a day in the summer, all summer long. So, you know, I was really into like the hidden knowledge. 
and information. The thinking ball out in secret to balling because immediately when I read the titles, it made me go to um, my man Napoleon Hill. Yeah, yeah, his brother's a student in Napoleon Hill. So talk yeah. about that a little bit and, and how he influenced you. Yeah, uh, well, thinking thinking grow rich was a, a big influence on me. It was a book that I kept on my counter in the shop. You know, I constantly would go in there and you know, what I'm saying just kind of do a flip through. And uh, I read the whole book, but I would flip through, just open the book and just wherever it landed, I start reading. And I, I, I really appreciate the book because the information that he was giving in there was really easy to apply. And so from there, I started listening to a lot of audio books, um, audio books. I'm a big fan of audio books. And one day my homeboys got in the car. We was on our way to the club and an audio book happened to be on when I started my car and they started clowning me about what I was listening to. And that's where I really came up with the idea to do projects and, and um, self-help information from a hip hop perspective. You know what I'm saying? And give it the energy that we all feel comfortable with. Right. Because, I you know, you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, because I, I was just saying, like, because it feels, you know, because we know, like, our vi vibration as far as people from the culture of hip hop, we have a different vibration than someone talking as if they're speaking in a, a college course, you know. So I just had to come with something with, with great information, you know, and that was the main thing. So, and that's why you got, got Thinking Ball out. Right, right. Um, I want to ask you though, because I heard you say this in one of your interviews with Dame Dash. I think it was the one with Van Lathan, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And you yeah. was like, "Man, I made a million dollars." You said, "Take it for somebody who made a million dollars cutting hair." Yeah. I want you to. I, I mean, that to me, that's amazing to even hear yeah. that. Can yeah. you walk us through, you know, um, some of your downfalls, but how you were able to be that successful cutting hair? Because that seems out, you know, yeah. crazy. But I believe yeah. it. Yeah, it, it is crazy. It wasn't it wasn't so much of the actual aspect of just cutting hair, um, cutting hair. I made a lot of money doing that, but I also owned the shop. I had my own product line. I had 18 different products coming in and out the shop. Um, I had side things that I was doing as far as, you know, um, going to sets. I had a company that I created called Dome Piece where I would go cut people that, you know, say I would go to uh, juvenile halls or go cut people that were in foster care give them a, like a good group rate, cut their hair. And um, I was just, I mean, I was flowing, man. I was out there just moving and grooving, man, being on sets, cutting entertainers on top of that, you know, but the main thing was just being in the shop, over 25 people paying me $150 a week, you know, everything combined turned into a big, big profit for me, you know what I'm saying? And I wouldn't change one thing about it, but, the, but I did learn a lot about it because actually, at that young of an age in my 20s, you're not thinking about stacking your chips because you think it never ends. You know, you think that the money, it, there's no there's no rainy days to a 20 year old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like right. you just keep, you know, you bring in money as fast as you bring it in, as fast as you you spend it. And I don't like to use the word spend because, you know, it's really circulation. But when you're a child, when you're young, it's spending because you don't it's, it's you buying things that don't that decrease in value as soon as you purchase them. You know, from the cars and the clothes and the shoes. And I mean, it was crazy. And then doing a lot of clubbing. So, you know, I really enjoyed my 20s being a businessman. But I learned a lot when I got to my 30s. You know, definitely. Right. During that time when you were um, a barbershop owner and you obviously had an LLC or S Corp or whatever kind of a business license that you needed. What, who, who schooled you on that kind of stuff? Where did you learn the lingo of, of proper business knowledge and things like that? Because that's not taught in school. And a lot right. of us, a lot of us, um, especially black in the black community, we don't know about this stuff unless we really go out and venture it on our own. We, we have no idea that this right. world even exists. So mm -hmm. coming out of L.A. and learning how you learning, what, what, who, how, who schooled you on that kind of stuff? Man, the blessing was I, you know, it I learned a lot from my clients that I, that were in my chair. You know, when I first got into business, like you say, like most black people or most people in general, I didn't know much about business and how it should be ran. But what happened was I began, I, I always cut a lot of professional people because I started real early in the morning. So, you know, the early, the early morning is for the professionals, you know, and the later in the day stuff is for a lot of your younger clients. You know, you get a few professionals here and there, but, you know, a lot of doctors, lawyers, you know, accountants and different things. And so I would ask a lot of questions. I've always been a person to ask questions, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, embarrassed to um, reveal my ignorance to anything. So, that's what really did it. And and uh, it's just a blessing to be able to be around those types, so many different types of people 
where you can even ask this information. You know, I, I would ask everything from, you know, from, the, you know, the lawyers I cut to the doctors, whatever, some health situations. So I've never been embarrassed of being ignorant to anything because I knew that, you know, the only way to come into the light is to gain knowledge and understanding of what you're going into. Definitely, definitely. I want you to expand more on your um, whole philosophy of failing, you know, to succeed. I think that was real, you know, powerful, you know, watching that and seeing some of what you wrote you now about it in the book. Yeah. You kind of that. I was just pretty much asking about your, um, you know, what you said in, in the video you made calling um, pretty much to um, failing to succeed. Yes. You know, and talk yes. about the many times how you can pretty much learn, you know, from your uh, your failures. Can you speak, you know, expound more on that for the audience that's listening? T take them through your journey about how you, you know, failed and now you are succeeding in business Absolutely. in your life. Absolutely. Well, failure, you know, the f failure is a great thing because failure means you're at least trying, you know, and to try means that, you know, you have an opportunity to reach success. So for me, for example, when I first started cutting hair for entertainers, you know, being that haircuts at that time back in the 90s were about like $20, $25 in the shop, I would go to the set and I would probably only charge them like 50 bucks or sometimes $100. And one time I did this without really understanding what the going rate was for cutting hair on the set. And being ignorant to it, I kept doing it, kept doing it, and then finally, you know, my boy Jay Brown, who is one of the heads over at Rock Nation, that's actually how I met Damon Dash as well. He pulled my coat to it and said, man, you know what, man? He was like, look, he said, we're going to stop messing with you if you keep charging this 50 bucks and this hundred dollars like that. And I didn't I didn't really at first I was like, oh, what? I thought that was the going rate. I thought that was cool. But, you know, going through looking back over the failure and what I did charge people and I didn't get what I was supposed to get. It actually brought me into a place where I really sat still and established my price. I established who I was going to be within that business. And so from failure, you know, the only thing with failure is, you know, it's like if you fall down, you know, if you can look up, as Les Brown says, you can get up. And so I continue to do that and I continue to do different things as far as um, expressing myself is what I what I demanded or what I desired when I came out before I even went out. You know, and then everything became at that much better. It became great because I was receiving what I asked for, you know, but you have to go through, you have to go through the trial and error of learning. You know, a lot of people don't like, they have a fear of not knowing something, you know, but the fear of not knowing something is what can actually drive you into the light. See, it's in that darkness is where we learn, you know what I'm saying? And the more conscious you become of a thing, the more the light begins to get brighter and brighter as you go along, go along. And so that's what I, I truly believe in just going through the going through whatever it is you're going to go through. Everybody's degree of failure is different, by the way, as we all know. So press forward, keep going, move, keep making your moves and keep, you know, keep striving to be better in whatever it is you're doing. Why do you think it is that so many people, very talented people and, and very driven people kind of fall at the wayside when it comes to fear or failure why do you think it's so easy for people to get away from that because it's very few people very few success stories there should be far more but see people seemingly kind of get stopped right at that roadblock and i have a, a great idea as to um yeah. as to why you push through your fear and we're gonna get into that because there's a deeper meaning to a lot of this conversation yes. i can't wait to yes. but why do you think so many people um so many talented people kind of stop where when it comes to fear or or failure well, I know I know one for sure, and I can I can vouch for this, and I can speak on this because I went through it myself. Uh, being you know, barbering was my hobby. It was something that it was my talent. It was just something that I did to make money. You know, it wasn't really my desire and what I really wanted to do. And even over the years, when I was in the shop, I was doing a lot of writing, reading, studying. I always had this idea to do something more within the book world. I would go to Barnes and Noble, and I would just imagine myself being in the bookstore and or whatever bookstore I was in. And the comfort of making as much money as I did in the barbering game stopped me from even attempting to start something new because I was already good cutting hair. So to go into something new means I have to go through the darkness and the slow times of not making money or not receiving any form of you know uh, recognition for my work or 
whatever it may be, you know, money, recognition, you know, so I knew that I, to start over again would be like me sitting on the block on Crenshaw Boulevard, handing the first person a business card. And so that kept me away from jumping off into hip hop motivation for years because I was already comfortable. You know, when you're making, making a nice amount of money or you're doing whatever you're doing, it can stop you from making moves. And it's the same thing that goes along with any relationship between men and women. A lot of people stay in jacked up relationships. I don't know if I can curse, but jacked up relationships yes, sir. based on comfort. They know something ain't right. They know they're getting abused. They know they're getting tricked. They know they're getting robbed. They know they're getting treated like a dog, but they decide to stay within the relationship because of comfort. And that is the worst thing that that is the biggest. That's the biggest. That is the biggest stop sign to all success is comfort. It's not fear it's comfort. And then it turns into fear, the fear of leaving, the fear of walking away. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Sometimes, you know, as we all know, with a woman, you have to walk away. You have to say yeah, enough is enough, including a woman with a man. If you're not getting treated right, enough is enough. Respect is on what you don't allow someone to pull you into. That's where you get your respect from, you know, without violence, without arguing, without going crazy. It's the same principle within business. You know, you have to be willing to step forward, walk away from something and go full head, full speed ahead and whatever it is you choose to do. Definitely. Right. man. Right. Right. De speaking. Yeah. Definitely speaking about business, man, to kind of transition just a little bit. And I can definitely me and Sam and over here, like resonating, like, you know what I mean? You know, and I had about some stuff that we're going through now in business. But um, yeah, anyway, I want to ask you about uh, Donald Trump. You yeah. know, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different, you know, um, things to say about him, especially us black people. You know, yeah. um, what would you say about Donald Trump? What, what do you think about Donald Trump and, you know, him being a president and how he's been, you know, performing thus far first? Well, to me, you know, I never I've never been one to look at a president or any form of government as being the head of anything that I do. I know that they're powerful. I know that they control the laws and and what goes on in the streets. But as far as Donald Trump, I feel like, you know, he is, he is, you know, a pig, he's a bigot, you know what I'm saying? It's been seen, he said it, he's expressed these things over and over again. And so people give him credit for being honest, but you know, it's like, would you give credit to a molester for being honest on being a molester and they keep molesting people? You know, it's the same principle. So to me, he's, you know, it's, it's just, it's idiotic. You know that he just believes that being white is is enough and and that's it you know what i'm saying like we control the world and you know the riches you know we you know we're, we're the best and and these people can't come over here you know when once upon a time you know mexico california was mexico you know what i'm saying and all this over here you know so it's like you, you it's, it's just ridiculous man to me you know i don't really get caught up in politics man because i already know it's a game you know, like I said, it's it's a form of insanity to be tripping off of somebody, uh, tripping off of something that you know hasn't shown you otherwise ever, because exactly. you can't name a time it's shown you otherwise. You know what I'm saying? It has not been another time where it has shown you otherwise, including with Abraham Lincoln. It's because people went to the streets and he signed the what's called Mac uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Right, right, right. You know, so you know, and if you know the history of that, but it's it's crazy because. We keep repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's insane. Uh -huh. You know, so I sit back and watch it and I just call it romanticism. You want things to be a certain way. You want everybody to be kumbaya and hold hands. But, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of damage, man. It's a lot of things that have to be repaired before that can happen. You know, a lot of things, especially with black people. Yeah, it seems like it's one big distraction, especially when they throw Kanye into play, because as soon as he throws on that MAGA hat, it seems like polarity gets shifted either toward you loving the MAGA hat, <laughs> the white folk that are are, are definitely out there absolutely. racist or the, or the pro black, quote unquote, that right. out of that MAGA hat and go absolutely crazy. It's crazy. It, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. almost it's like, wow, he is performing magic, how he mm -hmm. has y'all swayed both ways. Do you yeah. think it's more so of a distraction? And yes, about that? absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One hundred percent. You know, it's like, you know, as they say, the unseen hand, it's like if they can get enough people to focus on their agenda, they will lose contact with their own agenda. Uh -huh. You see, because everyone in this world should have their own agenda at this point. But there's also a collective agenda, you know, because we're all different. We're all pieces of the most high. We're all pieces of the same source energy. And so collectively, 
there is a perception of right and wrong that we all see but we seem to think that it's okay to make excuses for people that are bigots and that are tricky and why am i going to look to kanye to give me some information or some advice on politics or how i'm how, how i'm gonna live my life look at his world look at his life you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying does it i mean does it really look like he's doing okay beyond money no no the money's not even saving him just not that long ago he was in a, a hospital for mental illness mm -hmm. so it's like why am i looking to him to give me some advice and some information on how to run my family or how to run my life you know and it's that's a distraction because they know that you know the way they present it is black people look to musicians and and, and, and basketball players and football players for their information because that's the way it's been positioned based on the money that they give these people. And that's okay. You know, there's no right or wrong to the situation, but there is definitely a distraction uh, tech, tech, technique that's being, that's always been used to take our attention away from the real true, true meaning of things. And that's the, that's to understand natural law and that's to understand the power that we all hold within individually as well as collectively. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to, um, you know, shift gears and ask you, you know, about, you know, some of your uh, ventures mm -hmm. in particular. I want to shift to the culture vulture book. Right. And I want to ask you, um, can you just take us through first and foremost, you know, um, what motivated you? Because, you know, you and Dame Dash co-authored a book. But what motivated you two guys to come together and um, actually put that uh, artwork out there for the people? Well, for the for the actual idea for the book, it started off when I did thinking ball out and i interviewed him for a piece called the secret the ball and that's connected to thinking ball out the audio book mm -hmm. and i always told him i was like yo man when you when, you know when you finally sit still i would love to like write a book on you you know based around some of the things i hear you talking about with some of your guys here because dame is a very uh giving person when it comes to information and knowledge he's never uh if you ask him a question if you're you're close to him or you're in his proximity and you ask him something about business or what he thinks about something, he's very open and giving that information up, which is a good thing. And that's also the premise to write a great book. So what I did was he moved out here and I just, you know, I got back with him again. And I said, yo man, it's time to get this book going. So we started filming those hip hop motivation videos you see. And initially I wasn't gonna put the videos out. I wasn't, I wasn't they weren't meant to be seen. Those were only like sound bites that I, were, that I was collecting to fill the book up. I wasn't going to use everything, but it was just sound bites that I was going to use to fill the book up. And that's what we did. But we started putting them up and they became very popular. And so from there, as we we're doing the putting the videos up, I, I continue to write the book and figure out what chapters I'm going to use and all this different stuff. And um, and that's how everything came about. And the artwork on the cover of the book, uh, his lady, Raquel Horn, she drew this picture of a vulture. And Dane was always saying something about culture vulture. He kept saying culture vulture, culture vulture. Mm -hmm. And I just decided we decided to name the book Culture Vultures because originally it was called Reasonable Clout. And my idea was to have him on the cover of the book, you know, kind of dressed like Jay-Z was <laughs> for the cover of Reasonable Doubt, you know, but it would be Dame Dash on the cover of, of the book called Reasonable Clout. And that just became a section within the book, as you saw the first section. And mm -hmm. uh, we just kept moving, man. But it was a it, it was a it was a blessing that he even gave me the opportunity to write that book, man. And, I, you know. I never I, I told him before, but, you know, again, I appreciate him just sitting with me and allowing me to put that together because now I'm an author, you know, where right. before I wasn't an author, author completely because thinking about lots of audio book. And the only reason I didn't do a book, a physical copy, because I didn't know how to do it. But now I know how to do it. So but talk, right. Talk. I want you to explain that before we get into the culture vulture book. I want you to explain because I heard you speaking about this. Also, you were speaking right. about some trial and errors that you and Dame had trying to put the book out. Like you were trying yeah. to go through a few different people, oh. you know, uh -huh. something weren't working right. So yeah. you had to just say, you know what? We're going to do this thing on our own. Take us to that right. journey. Well, it was um, <clears throat> in the beginning when after I got like a lot of the chapters together, the first the first obstacle we had to go through what I had to go through was uh getting the right editor somebody that really could keep the lingo and the ebonics clear without making it sound so suspect you know what i'm saying it sounded like too too polished you know i wanted the book to have a rawness to it and so what i had to do i had to be close with who close with the people that edited the book but initially right off dame had kind of had a 
disagreement with the, the initial editor. And then she called me and said she didn't want to work for him or whatever. So I had to find somebody else. So I continued to write, you know, it was one of those. And then we got with somebody else and uh, he was, he was pretty cool, you know, no name shouting, but he was pretty cool. And then we got with someone else, some real people that really knew what they were doing. A girl named Tyra who is um, connected to Dr. Boyce Watkins when I connected Dame and Dr. Boyce together. And she came on the team and she did the editing for the book as well as a guy who did the graphic artwork for the book, uh, Michael, um, this guy named Michael. And he, I mean, shoot, man, we just, the, and then after that, once we got the book together, I know what you're talking about. After we got the book together, we were with uh, my homeboy, Paul Stewart, great guy, love Paul Stewart, but uh, him and Dame didn't hit it off well at a certain point within the union. And he, he had a book company. Paul Stewart has a book company. But Paul Stewart is the guy who put in put the far side in the game, Coolio and all those guys back in the day. And so Paul and Dame had a little situation. And so he backed up and sort of, you know, Dame calls it, you know, leaving us hanging. But I looked at it as it just it just was time for us, for me as an author and as a CEO of, of hip hop motivation to go into my research stage and understand on, on figure out how to put this book out and that's what i did so with the information that we were trying to get from paul we didn't get but it was a great opportunity for me to step up and do the research i need to do to be able to put other books out beyond culture vultures and that's what we have you know and that's what we're doing right now word you know when i was reading the book and as i'm going through the book uh i asked myself a question numerous times it was like wow why did they name the book Culture Vulture in particular? Because as you're doing promotion for the book and as Dane was doing promotion for the book, obviously Culture Vulture was a term that he used for your Leo Cohen's of the world and for people right. outside of our culture vulturing the culture. You know yeah, I mean, let's call it for what it is. And a lot of people that I asked if they read the book or bought the book, they were a lot of the haters. No, we're not going to buy a book on Dame Dash complaining about blah, 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 blah. So yeah. when I read the book, I thought it was going to be Dame going all the way in. <laughs> On this person, Ooh, that man. person, that person, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I read it and I'm like, man, this is a self-help book. This is motivation. Yeah. This is yeah. this is on a whole different realm. So was that right. kind of like you, you, you guys plan or how did that work out? It, in was, it was my plan. You know, I, you know, being the author, you know, we recorded Dane as well as we putting up the videos on Dane speaking about his agenda within business. But I took everything and I just packaged it up to be a self-help project. I didn't really want to get too much because there's so much information, so much, so much dialogue that we had where he was actually really going in on some people. But I didn't feel like that's not that's not what the culture needs. What the culture needs is information that can help them go beyond any obstacle that stands in front of them. So I turned his situation with Leo Cohen, Tom Moscovich, whoever he talks about, everybody that he talks about in the book as a form of an obstacle that all of us will be faced with at one time or another, you know, going through the darkness into the light. And so I just, I, I personally love self-help books. So it had to be a self-help book for me to even write. It. Yeah. And I love the gems. Like every, after every chapter you wrote, like yeah. the most important parts, that was so dope. And one of the parts you talked about, um, partnerships and oh god and i've been talking about this so many times within the last couple of weeks as far as bad partnerships what are good partnerships we've been dropping them on our various platforms on youtube and you talked about how you had so many bad partnerships early on that it kind of puts you in a place where you couldn't trust people talk about that process with partnerships and where you're at now with it and, and the goods and bads with partnerships because it, it's so important out here especially in business yeah well what happened was you know i had a few people that were you know, they were placing their bet on whatever we came together to do. But as soon as we hit hard times, they would pull the bet from the table. And, you know, which which is which is understandable because a lot of people don't want to, you know, they don't people are afraid to go through the shit. You know, they're afraid to go through the dark times. But for me, I understand that anything that goes through a building stage has to go through the darkness. You have to go through the building stage. You have to go through, like, as Dame says, being broke. You have to go through flipping your money and, and until you get your money back. You have to go through these things. And, you know, it was a lot of situations where I just could not, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't stomach even doing business with someone and they didn't even understand that philosophy. So, you know, right now where I'm at as far as business, you know, I'm trusting until someone shows me otherwise, you know. Oh, that's what I came to learn. You know, I just trust people until they show me otherwise. 
you know, and I continue to do what I'm doing. But it's hard to say that you can really trust anyone fully at all, you know, as far as business goes. But then that's that's also insane because you do have people that live by the rules of the game. You know, they're not, they're not going to cheat. They're not going to steal from you. They're not, they're not going to rob you. They're not going to try to stab you in your back. So I just really just stay who I am and until someone shows me otherwise. That's really the way it goes with me. You know, and it's just like that with the relationship. Like business and relationship are so closely connected. It's like, how do you really trust your girl? You know what I'm saying? When, you know, a lot of men know that a lot of women get a change of heart real fast. You know what I'm saying? You know, so how do you really trust anyone? But the main person you I had to learn how to trust was myself. And so when I began to trust myself, what someone else did became no consequence to me. It was just like, okay, well, you did that. Okay, I'll just stay over here. You stay over there. It didn't hurt me as much as I thought it would because I have a trust in myself and that I can actually continue going on and what I need to do. And that's what I continue to do, especially in the barbershop. I had, I had some situations like that. Yeah. You still, definitely, you definitely. still got the barbershop up now, my battle guy. What'd you say? Do you still have the barbershop now? No, I sold the barbershop when I when I walked away. I walked away from the barbershop about it's about like five years ago, something like that. I walked oh. away from the shop and I um I just said it was like a it was like an effort situation and I said I'm gonna go full blast into what I'm doing. Um I still cut. I cut private though. I have a private uh salon that I, you know, I cut hair at myself and my my lady. And um, it's been it's been beautiful because I have I only cut two days a week, by the way, and um, I have more time to really work on projects and do what I need to do. And so that's how we were able to do the secret, the ball in behind me thing. You know, I'm working on thinking ball out the book right now. So and um, it's just clearing my day to put forth effort into the business of hip hop motivation. Definitely, definitely. Before I ask you a question on hip hop motivation, I want to ask you the motivation behind hip hop motivation. I want to ask you this question about the Culture Vultures book, real quick. Did you guys receive any backlash, or are you receiving any backlash from anybody? Because we've seen uh, Leo Cohen, who pretty much um, went on Dame Dash on the Breakfast Club, mm. made statements, tried to, you know, disrespect him pretty much. Right. And um, but he also showed his hand at the same time. We did some commentary on that. So, what would you say? Um, about that could you explain you know expound on that a little bit well everything it just made the book more valid you know damon i had a conversation about it as soon as that happened he just made the book more valid man like everything in that book is straight up you know what i'm saying there ain't no lies it ain't no no fabrication ain't no extras put on it everything dame said was really how we went now from his perspective now leor cohen obviously will have his perspective like all of us do and you know but he exposed himself as being a culture vulture live on the breakfast club which was a beautiful thing because he also made the book sales go up mm -hmm. I you said know, because that. then yeah. it turns into okay now so what dame is saying must be true because here he is he couldn't even catch himself because you know a vulture they're always going to expose themselves eventually anyway the same thing that you just asked me about business and trust someone will always expose themselves regardless to what you say it's just like what our elders used to tell us what's done in the dark will always come to light always there's no escaping it and so that's what leo cohen did on the breakfast club and i thought it was beautiful i was laughing i was like oh my god and when i talked to dame he was like see that's what i'm talking about <laughs> immediately the books immediately the books took off even i more. bet i bet now i want to also ask you you know um about the culture vulture you know this aspect of the book um the backlash did you have you are you receiving any backlash i don't think you answered that part of the question from anybody now that the book is out even though like anybody they try to stop it are they trying to stop it like could you talk about that aspect no nah, no nah, i haven't received we haven't received any backlash every now and then we get somebody on instagram you know usually it's a white person that's saying something like, well you know you're saying white people can't be in hip-hop and that's not what we're saying if you read the book Mm -hmm. The book has nothing to do with race in general, but yeah. let's keep it real. There's more of them doing sneaky business moves more than any other race of people within the business. So let's just let's just let's let's keep it real about the situation. It's just like the thing going on with Donald Trump. These people have victimized other races over the years, and so we can't lie and act like we don't see it. That's turning the blind eye to what's in front of you. Then that turns into romanticism. You want to hold hands and kumbaya, but they have shown you that they're gonna clip you, they're gonna rob you. And so it's it's 
it's not about white, black, Hispanic, whoever wants to be in hip hop. Hip hop is for is 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 open to all cultures of people as far as race goes. But for some strange reason, as we all know, and as we you know our aunt, our elders know from back in the day with different record labels, you know these these other people have taken advantage of people that don't have information and an understanding of how business really works, and they prey on the mentally dead. As a vulture preys on what dead carcass, they prey on the mentally dead. The culture vulture preys on the mentally dead. They take advantage of the mentally weak, mentally dead. But what we did with that book is we packaged up some information, some knowledge, and some understandings that will help people use wisdom when they move around and around these people. Well, they have the wisdom of what to look for and what to see, not by the numbers, but just understanding what they're hearing and seeing when they see it. And that's what we that's what the Breakfast Club showed you when uh, they interviewed uh, Leo Cohen. That's a prime example of what we're trying to teach. Pay attention. Thank Listen you. more than you talk. Great perspective. Now, you said that vultures like to prey on the mentally dead because they they feed on dead carcasses. Mm -hmm. Flat TV. Now, we've seen our man ARAP get put in a <laughs> terrible situation out in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Looking mm -hmm. like he's doing some time and immediately soon as he got put away. The, the comments and everyone immediately went to Vlad, the Vlad interview, the Vlad interview, the Vlad interview. Um, one of my one of the parts of the on the sections of the book that I look forward to the most in Culture Vulture was the conversation about Vlad. And one of the things that surprised me the most is Dame in the book never called Vlad a Culture Vulture. Not in no. the book. No. So talk about that aspect. Talk about Vlad, because when you say when you when you when you say that uh, a vulture like feeds on a mentally dead. I can't help but to think of some of these rappers that go on some of these platforms and yeah. run in their mouth. So just talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. At the time when we interviewed Vlad for the book, he was doing the exchange with Dane to be on his platform. So we told him what we were doing and he was like, game. He was like, cool. So he came through Dane's crib in Malibu. So we filmed him. He gave up a lot of great information. Actually, what's funny is in the questions we were asking Vlad, he was very apprehensive initially um if you go back and watch the videos and i gotta put the raw video the raw footage of that up um he didn't want to answer certain things about numbers and so dane was uh, was was all over him about it you know he's like Yo, give me the numbers what, what's this what's that you know you know how dane get down so he was putting pressure on him and then vlad started answering questions and um from there uh dame and vlad had a situation where they got into it as you know, you saw the other video we put up where he was talking about Vlad being, I think, did we call it culture motion? Vlad's a culture motion or Vlad is? Maybe that you did. I think we yeah, heard I think Vlad something did. like that. And I talked to Vlad since then, but, you know, Vlad's cool. But as far as people going on his platform, giving up information, it's just the it's just the fools that do it. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's like cats that rap about selling dope and they got packs in their mama's house. It's like, come on, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like you dumb or you stupid. Which one are you? You know what I'm saying? Ignorance is, is, is very clear when a cat can go on a platform and tell all his business about what he's really doing or what he done did and tell on himself. You know what I'm saying? It's like they need to go listen to MF Doom song, Rap Snitches. You know what I'm saying? The, the chorus go, Rap Snitches, telling all their business. Sit in the court and be their own star witness. Do you see the perpetrator? Yeah, I'm right here. Fuck around, get the whole label center for years. You're your own, you're, you're putting yourself out there you deserve what you get if you're putting yourself out there on any platform, Vlad included. You know what I'm saying? But as far as Vlad being tied to the feds, I don't really know. You know what I'm saying? I can't really speak on is he, is he tied to the feds. But, you know, there's been some obvious signs that something's going on. You know, I haven't been on there, but I know some obvious signs that something's going on. Because, you know, immediately after that, what happened? Oh, boy, got locked up. Mm -hmm. So we know somebody's paying attention, but it ain't that. It, it, it could very well mean that. I mean, as we all know, we should know that they all watching, man. They paying attention to everything we do. They watching it. They gonna watch this show. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. If this ain't up live right now, they watching. They, I mean, they gonna watch. They gonna they they gonna listen for cues. They gonna pay attention to what's being said. It's it's obvious, man. It's obvious. Right Scary now. Times. Yeah, yeah. Do you would you guys um do y'all still like uh plan on doing business with uh Vlad in the future or what, what's that situation like? No, nah, not. I mean, for myself, I don't plan on doing business with Vlad. You know, Vlad has his lane. I can't speak for Dame. I doubt Dame will do business with him because, you know, him and Vlad had a little situation. Mm -hmm. And um, 
he kept, you know, Vlad kept calling Dane uh, when he was with his daughter, and Dane was telling him, like, you know, hold on, I'll call you back. But Vlad kept calling him, and then Dane kind of got, you know, kind of, kind of got at him a little bit. And Vlad called me and told me that, you know, he was like, man, you know, uh, Dame, Dame uh, threatened me, and I was like, threaten you? How he threatened you? And he's like, yeah, man, wait, uh, I, I might have to tell the people over at uh, Complex how he's talking to me. You know, and then right after that, we didn't do any. We were, we were on our way to do something having to do with complex, but it didn't go through. Um, I don't know if Vlad has something to do with it, but I know that he told Dame definitely. He told me that, you know, he didn't like the way Dame was talking to him or getting at him or something like that. You know, the video's up on YouTube, as you know, but mm -hmm. um, and I told Dame and he was like, F Vlad. And that was the end of that relationship. And I was kind. Of, it was kind of unfortunate because it was it was brewing to be a great relationship because Vlad was coming through some from time to time, just building with us, breaking bread, come through, have a little breakfast or whatever out in Malibu, and it was cool. You know, I never had no problem with Vlad. Vlad was cool to me, but you know, like anything else, man, I just wait. Pe I wait for people to expose themselves. Once you expose yourself, then I have to. Then it's up to me to get fooled again, or if I just you know I back up from you. You know, but he's a cool dude, you know, but I don't know about the Fed thing, man. I've been paying attention and I just think he he asks questions a certain way. And these dudes get these lights and these cameras in their face and they get to saying anything. You know what I'm saying? Be, because you're a rapper don't mean you 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 understand you have common sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We all know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Common sense is just something that's not given to everyone. Facts. We'll talk about that a little bit because we, oh God, and I talk about this a number of times on the podcast as well. We didn't come from an age where you told, they talked about anything. I remember the first time I got my tattoo and my grandfather was all over me. He was hot. You a fool. What are you doing? You don't mark up yourself. That's how you, you telling on yourself. Yeah. You grew up under age where you didn't say anything. And now in 2018 with social media going crazy, it seems like it's the popular thing to do. So just talk about that and, and where that separation you feel like came about where we went from an age of not being not telling our business at all to telling everything. Well, I, I personally think that it's there's an era of an era of disconnect on parents, you know, um, the elders teaching the young on the prince about the principles of being a man is including being a woman, you know, mainly being a man more than anything else. Um, there's a disconnect. So if you don't have, if your point of reference doesn't teach you how things go and that, you know, about telling on yourself, snitching or whatever it may be, or how to carry yourself among people, it's going to be, you have to learn these things through trial and error. And a lot, that's what happens. A lot of these guys learn through trial and error. And I bet, you know, the brother that's sitting in prison that was talking to Vlad, he's sitting in prison like, damn, I shouldn't have said nothing. You know, that's how a lot of us have to learn from falling on our ass a few times before we really get it. And so, but if your caregiver is not teaching you, how will you know? You'll know as you become an adult, you'll start experiencing certain setbacks and you can learn from that. But some people don't learn from these things, man. And they get on social media with all these distractions. They don't even take the time to know themselves. They have no knowledge of self. They're automatons, man. They brain is styrofoam. They don't know themselves. I be seeing some of the stuff even being put up. You know, even when people was talking about Kanye West the whole damn month. I'm like, oh God. I put up a post and I said, you know, to the to the uh I said the one-eyed man is king to the mentally blind. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And nobody really got it. It was a few people that got it, but it was like over their head. Why are, you, why are we looking to Kanye? to give us information about how to live our life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Come on, man. Are we? Are you serious? This fool be going up and down. Why would I listen? Why would I listen to any, really be honest with you, you? Why would you listen to anybody about how to run your life or how to do a certain thing? Well, there's so much information out here to read, to study. You can go to YouTube and find out how to do anything, how to bake a cake. Damn. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Why you don't have to, you don't have to go through anyone to get information, but people are lazy. You know what I'm saying? They don't want to take the time to do research. And that's what I that's what I did when Paul Stewart got out the way. I took my time. I did my research. I went through some different companies to learn how to put this book out. And I figured it out. I learned the book game. But it wasn't easy. But it's worth it. Because in the end, at the end of the day, you got to put in the work to to get achieved, to, to move towards achievement, man. And it's, it's no laziness. You can't be lazy when it comes to learning, man. 
Once you stop learning, you're dead. You're mentally dead. And that's what you see a lot of on social media, man. That's why people all day long is just focused on so many different, they focused on death, police brutality. They, oh, man, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wait to go online. I put up my post, but I get off real quick, man. Uh -huh. And then after a while, you even get numb to seeing booty up on videos, man. You get numb to the girl shaking her ass after a while. You be like, damn, this like, I'd be like, on some sites, man, I'd be like, damn, I like pretty girls like any other man. But sometimes you'd be like, damn, do all the girls strip? What's going on? What is happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What is going on with with with, with the philosophy? Out? What are these parents teaching their children? These parents are not teaching their children. They hanging out and going to clubs. They damn self when the kids was little. Mm -hmm. You got to sit still. You got to talk to your child, man. You got to have open dialogue with your children. And if you don't, look at what's, look at what's going on right now. And it'll get worse from the, if you don't if you don't start implementing some conversations and communication with your child now imagine what it'd be 10 years from now man because we just seen it y'all y'all you know what I'm saying you guys mm -hmm. from the 90s so you know you've seen like how things have shifted mm -hmm. every yeah. 10 years we see a different shift going on and so 10 years from now what's it going to be what's what has to happen is we have to individually get into get back into you know raising our children talking to our young you know, our, our family members, our friends, you know, if they're willing to listen, though, you know, some of these youngsters ain't willing to listen. You know, yeah. they blinded by what they see. Fact, facts, man. So you got the shirt on right there, man. The hip hop motivation shirt, man. Oh, yeah. I just got to say, man, a beautiful, beautiful platform. I love the platform. I love how you and Dame Dash, you know, y'all chop it up. And even y'all do your individual things. But talk about the motivation behind hip hop motivation for the family. Right. Great question. Well, what happened was, you know, the story goes when I first started, when I first came up with the name Hip Hop Motivation, as well as the uh, project Thinking Ball Out, the whole layout for the book, how I was going to do it, what I was going to do. And um, I got a call from Method Man from Wu-Tang Clan to come cut his hair. And I didn't make it to cut his hair because I got shot six times. So while in that position, laying on the ground, laying on the ground, getting harassed by the cops, you know what I'm saying? Um, just just hanging on a little bit, low key died and come back. That whole feeling, I blacked out, went out for a minute, came back. They brought me back in critical condition. I continued to write and develop the book Thinking Ball Out when I was in the hospital, as well as come up with more ideas on what I was going to do with hip hop motivation. At that time, I was still in the shop making a lot of money. So I was kind of teeter tottering between going off into hip hop motivation full speed, full time, or continue doing what I'm doing, make my money and just chill comfortable. So I that's what took me so long to get everything pretty much rolling. Um, but the motivation behind it was the day I got shot. And I just was like, you know what? This must this is a sign. I must. I must uh, move forward in what I what I came up with because it was only an hour before you know an hour before I got shot I came up with the name hip hop motivation thinking ball out I left got shot now I'm in the hospital here we are today yes sir yes sir um, yeah so talk about your new book too because you you um you got the one the secret to balling then you have another book you're working on could you talk about you know those and how that all came together. Yeah, the audio is an audio book. The Secret of the Ball is an audio book. I'm um right. I'll be working on the physical copy of the book right after Thinking Ball Out the book. Um, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm almost finished, and then I have another book called My Barber's Hand Stink through Hip Hop Motivation Kids, uh, teaching children about hygiene and you know what to do and what not to do. And um, that's that's gonna we're gonna actually I'm a, I'm gonna create a launch for that in 2019 for Hip Hop Motivation Kids. And um, can continue doing books for children, for adults, for young adults, movies. You know, Secret of Baldwin was a movie. So what we did with the movie was we just went around and I, basically in a nutshell, it was me going around doing case studies on what is success and what really constitutes success. You know, like asking Snoop Dogg the same question I would ask Michael Bernard Beckwith. Uh, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith from Agape, he was also in the movie called The Secret, and asked them the same questions and see if there was some sort of connection on what real true success is. And there were a lot of connections, you know, because as they say, success leaves clues. And so when you see that movie, The Secret of the Ball, and that was all handmade, 
It didn't have no, I had no budget. And honestly, we didn't have none of those people on the list of who we were going to interview. The funniest thing is, Dame wasn't even out here when we were, uh, when we started that movie. We just started filming whoever we could film and get a little interview from. The first guy we filmed was funny. He's not in the movie because the footage was messed up. Uh, was Big U from uh, out here. He's uh, one of the heads of the Roman 60s, and he does a lot of things with uh, prison reform, helping people when they get out of prison, uh, get job placement, and he works with a lot of children and that at risk youth. And we interviewed him. It was a dope interview, but we couldn't use it. But we kept rolling. And we didn't have, I didn't have Chris Brown. I didn't have Snoop. I didn't have none of these people. And then when I would see them or if I was in the position where I was around these guys, I would just ask if they would do it. And they would do it. They did it. That's it. And so we put it together. I went through a lot of trial and error with that movie. You want to talk about some trial and error? I went through the guy that was doing the filming, that was actually filming the movie for us. Um, he just went AWOL and we had to continue going. And so, you know, I, I, I didn't stop until it was finished. That's why it took so really so long to come out because I couldn't stop until it was finished, man. I had to keep going. Definitely, definitely. I want to ask you um about your relationship. You said you met Dame Dash <laughs> and um through a Rockefeller or something like that. Um yeah. could you speak on that and just speak on briefly, you know, um how it is to be, you know, to work with. I mean, I'm sure y'all mentor each other, you know, just how how did, how is it to be in Dame Dash's presence, man? You talk about that. Yeah, well, I first first I met him through, like I said, Jay Brown from uh, who's over at Rockefeller now, uh, Rock Nation now, and I started cutting him and Biggs first, and then I started cutting all the other guys from Rockefeller, and I just always was connected more to Dame and Biggs because Dame and Biggs were more about the business; they were more about what it takes to make something a success, the behind the scenes stuff that nobody knows about. And a lot of times when I would be cutting James hair, he'd be on the phone or he'd be talking to someone because he talks a lot, as we all know. And I would just be soaking up game. And I'd be like, damn, this dude is off the chain. And, you know, and 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 I was like sort of like that within my business because I had a product line. I had, you know, I had different things I was doing and, and different businesses I was trying to get off the ground on top of just having the barbershop. And so my admiration came from me being the same thing, you know, being a serial entrepreneur you know, trying to get the chip, you know? And so I just became, I just, I just would call. And then I, then what happened was like, even when I would go cut his hair, sometimes I would sit there and chill after I cut his hair and I would talk to him. And I noticed he wouldn't push me or turn me away or be like trying to rush me off. Like Dame was real down to earth. You know what I'm saying? Like he seemed like he bougie and shit, you know what I'm saying? And there's some of that there, you know what I'm saying? Dame is, you know, can be an asshole, but he one of the most down to earth people, you know, out of all the, a lot of these guys I'll be around, he one of the most down to earth. I would say him and Red Man probably the most, you know what I'm saying, and Meth. They the most down to earth probably I've ever been around on, on that level. But he just never turned me away. And, and being around him is great because for me, when I'm around him, you know, we talk and we deal. You know, the things you guys don't see is we really have conversations, deep conversations. He'll ask me some questions. But for the videos, I found it more important for me to sit still and get quiet so everybody watching everybody from the culture can get the information because i wanted to bring the information to our phones and to our computers you know what i'm saying wherever we were at all of us from the culture of hip-hop and i made that sacrifice because initially we weren't even monetizing the videos i was just throwing them up i was like i didn't know nothing about no monetization i was mm -hmm. like man psh, yeah this is for my people mm -hmm. you know first and foremost black people but then I was like, shit, the whole culture of hip hop, this is for y'all, man. This is for us. Because if I felt that way from listening to him, I was like, for damn sure, y'all gonna y'all gonna be like, damn. Like this is some this is some shit. Cause you never get a chance to hear these type of conversations. Usually we hear some bubblegum conversations about 50 Cent or who doing what and Kanye West and the hat he wearing and who he married to and how many girls is over here. And it's like, that's the same old shit, man. It's like that's masturbation, man. It's like a seed that goes nowhere. If you keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again, what is it? It's not doing anything for you. It's not providing growth. You know, I wanted to show man, I wanted to show that we could be men on a platform without talking about gossip. We ain't talk about gossip. If something came up, as you saw, we talk about it, but we'd be like, oh, okay, but what's the solution here? What, what should this person be doing on this level? We never talked about nobody. You know what I'm saying? 
none of those guys can go back and say we was actually sitting there talking about anybody. We talked like men, and we wanted to show that. We wanted to showcase that. And you don't really see that too much out there, man. Like, wow. how y'all building, y'all building like men. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you don't see that a lot. You know that. You don't see that a lot. You just see, you know, the girly man talking about gossiping and what's somebody doing. Who cares? Well, it's interesting you say that because it, it, it made me spark to a couple of questions. One, one of my favorite conversations between uh, you and Dame Dash was with Van Lathan and the whole nine to five versus boss perspective. Now, we yeah. we were starting on the Instant True podcast as we started highlighting local business people of um of black businessmen black businesswoman in our area started giving them you know what i mean a seat on the podcast and talking about their journey and right. we started doing that and propelling that because as we started going through the pie process and started gaining notoriety we realized we needed to start doing a little more exclusive interviews and the more we kind of reached out to people it was met with a little bit of resentment and when we look at our numbers and we kind of go number for number it's not to be cocky but we rank with some of the top out there doing it on YouTube, nice. right? So we kind of nice. understand why we were kind of gaining resentment. So we was like, all right, we're not going to focus on that. We're not going to put energy into that. We're going to sit there and highlight the people really doing it. We're going to create our own. And nice. one of the conversations we had with one of what, well, excuse me, was with one of my bros, Trev. He owns an electronic buy and sell electronic store where he buys and sells and trades electronics over the internet. Great young brother. And the conversation of the nine to five perspective came up because he still right. has a mm -hmm. job. As right. he's still building his business, and we kind of yeah. had him on a hot seat, and we talked about Dame Dash. We said, Dame, yeah. you know what I mean? Dame Dash said, if you have a nine to five, you're a sucker, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, he yeah, gave us an interesting yeah. perspective, yeah. and he said yeah. he didn't grow up like Dame yeah. Dash. He wasn't right. in, in the realm of it being able to be a hustler and have the, the, the resource he had to be able to go and grind on his own. He had to grow up in a household where the job was prominent, and he understood, but in having a job, he knew that that boss wasn't his, his yeah. overseer. That Absolutely. was a way to get back into the business. So just talk yeah. about that perspective a little bit. Yeah. It gave us yeah. great insight. Yeah, we I mean we had we we didn't really have disagreements about it, but I have my perspective on people that have deals and have children and have things to take care of. I'm a firm believer that if you're already involved in something and you already have these bills and these things coming at you, you know, don't give up your job right off until you create some form of money coming from whatever it is you're trying to go into. Now, your guy, he's very, I mean, that's that's a, that's the that's the best way to go into any business is to kind of balance the two. But the only thing about it is a lot of people don't put the time into the the real vision, which is what he's doing. He's you say he's an electric, he's doing a uh uh, elect, 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 he's an electrician or electronics. No. Yeah, what he's doing is buying okay, so, electronics. Yeah, plug to plug. Yeah, so if he's in electronics, that means like when he gets off, he needs to be full speed ahead on putting that time into building that electronic business. Uh -huh. But it's 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 very hard to get disciplined in when you get off work. You know, I know a lot of you know. What I'm saying I don't know if you guys ever had the jobs. Oh yeah, I've had them in this. Yeah, yeah we definitely did. In the barber shop, it's hard to really do something else when you had a long day and and. You like, damn, okay, and you got your money in your pocket, or you got a check already. You fall back and you start watching the game, you start doing all types of stuff. But you know, if he's motivated to stay focused on his real true purpose, which is the electronic store, then I don't see nothing wrong with uh bouncing the two until he gets it up to speed to where he can walk away from uh his job that he has right now. I'm a I'm a firm believer in that, man, because it's hard as hell out here, man. You know what I'm saying? It ain't, it ain't easy out here. You know what I'm saying? You can't just all of a sudden think your think think some money in your pocket. You got to make some moves. You got to make moves, you know? And if you ain't making moves, it's going to move on you. So you got to step up and, and, and work your job, but also get on your purpose every single day until it becomes a real, a real lifestyle for you where you can walk away from that gig. That's what I believe in. If wow. you're already doing that. Now, if you ain't doing that, that's all good. But as we all know, the best way to start is while you're young. But a lot of us, we don't do that. We don't start when we're in our, our when we're 18 at home or 17 at home. We start when we get we get in our 30s and 40s. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. by that time, we already some of us already have children. We already got bills. The slavery has started. Mm -hmm. and we got bills to pay, and so it's hard for us to move away and jump off, jump away from something where we're making money into something that hasn't even presented itself being able to make money. So, you know, for the youngsters out there, start while you're young. You know, if I if I knew it, if I could give any advice on anything, start while you're young and parents stop kicking your children out the house so fast. 
Right. You know, don't emancipate your children as soon as they turn 18, as soon as they walk across the stage. Help them get things started. Help them go into the to what they really want to do, their real true purpose. And if they don't know their purpose, pay attention to what they like to do. That's how you find your purpose. What's your hobby? If your hobby's video games, become a become a writer for for uh for video for a video game magazine. Learn how to test games out and do like your own your own podcast on what game is good, what game is bad. You know, mm -hmm. there's all types of ways to make money nowadays. You know, there's no excuse. <laughs>